except for Jory and me. Welcome to the Global Justice Report, an online production of the Center for Global Justice. I'm Cliff Duran, your host for today's program. The Center for Global Justice, well, Central para la Justicia Global, is a multinational and bilingual research center located in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. The center is devoted to research and learning for a better world and empowering a solidarity community. Um, due to the pandemic, we've discontinued our in-person events and instituted these online uh, webinars. Without that, uh, the revenue of those um, programs, we now depend on your donations to support the webinars and to be able to continue to pay our Mexican staff. You can donate at www.globaljusticecenter.org. We're happy to receive donations of any size. It helps us survive through these um, lean times. Today's program, inaugurates Black History Month. Um, throughout this month, we will have a number of speakers looking at various topics. We will have um, Lewis Gordon, uh, who will be talking about his new book just out um, on, uh, um, well, let's see, I forget the exact title. It, he, he'll be talking about black consciousness, political realities. Um, and we will also have uh, Cherry uh, Steinmiller, St Steinwender, uh, who heads up an interesting project located in Houston on healing racism. <coughs> you know, through these webinars. Um, we've had a number already um, previously, but we want to contribute to the national reckoning uh, with racism. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, today, we're pleased to have with us Joy Gordon, Joy James, excuse me, yes. Lewis Gordon comes later. Uh, <laughs> Joy James, um, is a philosopher, a professor of humanities at Williams College. She's worked with activist organizations for decades and uh, has a, a new book she's working on now on um, the, the captive maternal, uh, which is a topic that she will be discussing some today as well. Um, She's um, authored a number of other books, um, including the uh, uh, Black Feminist Reader um, and, um, um, let's see, also editor of uh, Imprisoned Intellectuals, The New Abolitionists, um, and, and others. Um, the book that is most relevant to today's topic is uh, Resisting State Violence. Um, and so let me turn the floor over to Joy and um, she'll have some remarks after which 
we can then have discussion with her. Go ahead, Joy. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I very much look forward to our discussion together. I don't want to be repetitive because I spoke quite a bit when we were um, coming online. But I mean, what we're confronted with in this moment for some of us is absolutely terrifying because we have no strategies, no political strategies, I believe, that will be adequate to the moment. And so there are political strategies out there. So the question is, which ones can we work with? Can we amplify? Can we leverage? Can we synthesize? To what degree we can actually come together in a mobilization that would resist the increasing militarization, the, the rise of a billionaire class that has no supervision or governance, right? That can restrain it its most aggressive um, tendencies, and also the rise of, the, of white supremacy. Sometimes I think that it's performative as a distraction to look away from the poverty and climate devastation, but even if it's performative, it still manages to kill, not just physically, but souls and whole sectors of communities. So I wanna start with resisting state violence, which Cliff asked me to talk about. And I wanna talk about that for, a little bit and then move on to the capital and close with a captive maternal. So when I was writing resistance, uh, resisting state violence in the 1990s, right, I was mostly an academic and a feminist. Throughout the 80s, I came to New York City in the 80s and that's when I became an activist. I grew up mostly on military bases. I was born in Frankfurt, Germany, you know, so I just travel from there. Um, my father was middle class. He um, had you know, graduate degrees from Notre Dame, which means he was in intelligence, right? So, and he was an officer. So there are ways in which, particularly when we settled in Texas, we were geared towards the military as an economy and a zone of ideology and patriotism, almost as a form of religiosity, right? We didn't really buy into it because they talk about it in resisting state violence that my family, my parents would have these cocktail parties at our home and the black officers would show up and the women are in silk and they're drinking scotch and they're listening to jazz, you know, John Coltrane. It's like, yeah, it seems lovely, right? But at the same time that they have a, a I would say it's modest, you know, by in comparison to the, the wealthy and to white wealth, they have a modest revenue stream to stabilize their families, which is why they're in the military, right? and they're mocking their employer. So this is part of what I gestured to in the book. So the loyalty to the military is not as tenacious among African-Americans, right? Or people who I, I need a degree or I need a job, I need economic stability. It is not, it doesn't have that fervor that white patriots exhibit. And they exhibit that not only in their loyalty to the state or their loyalty to Trump, you know, I'm skipping ahead to the present moment, but also their commitment to imperialism. So whatever my father was doing to make money that paid for our braces and music lessons, whatever, it was conflicted. And I would say that's why he exited, meaning, you know, he died in his 50s, right? That there is, there's a tension and a conflict. There's a desire to belong to a democracy that, you know, did enslavement, convict prison leasing, incarceration, still have the 13th Amendment, which legalizes slavery if you've been duly convicted of a crime, Jim Crow, you, you know, assassinations, you know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, we can go on, the Kennedys, et cetera, et cetera. So this conflict, I always thought it was like unbearable tension, especially as a child, right? But now I'm wondering if it's actually the place we have to go to in order to go to another level, to deal with to address our conflictedness of wanting to belong to an empire, wanting to belong to a certain kind of consumer class, right? Address our fear to rebel, which is, you know, I, I said I was a, a rebel. So yeah, I'm gonna use the term to rebel against structure, against politics, and also certain types of theologies coming out of conservative churches who back the January 6th insurrection or whatever term you want to present or call it. So 
resisting state violence for me is part of narrative about the US. And I'd mentioned before we, we started taping that I had gone to Nicaragua and I had gone to a refugee camps or Salvadorans who had been um, tortured and mutilated by Contras, which you know our tax dollars were paying for. And so in those conversations are going to uh, daycare centers, which were targets, right? So Henry Kissinger, Brzezinski and discriminate deterrence on a, a article manifesto, you want it, whatever you want to call it, that they wrote in the 1980s said all the wars would be in the so-called third world. It wasn't going to be in the Cold War because the 80s is still the Cold War until 89. And then you can see it tilting with Gorbachev. The wars were going to be fought in the communities and on the lands of so-called people of color. They were going to be fought in Africa and the Caribbean and Latin America. And the casualties were going to mount up there. And under our form of democracy, which was born out of genocide and enslavement, the value of people of color is so minimized, right? That their deaths and mutilations don't radiate across the news as shockwaves. And we could talk about what happened with George Floyd in the protests, right? Um, last year or you know, before. But I wonder how much of that was, how to say it, not a commitment to the people themselves, just an embarrassment for the democracy. Yes, there were people out in the streets who were outraged, you know, eight minutes plus, he's calling for his mother. It was that kind of spectacle lynching, that kind of spectacular terror, which could mobilize these movements. But that kind of those kinds of killings have been going on for decades. So back back to the 80s. I mean, it's the Reagan administration. And so it's easy for us because he's a Republican. We understand him to be a reactionary and we can mobilize under that. But if you fast forward so you can see I'm going across time and space here. But if you fast forward to 2008 and it's a black Harvard grad who's polished you know, and has an interesting name, Obama, and, you know, a gorgeous black wife who's, you know, a mix of, I came out of, you know, the city, you know, the neighborhood, the hood in Chicago, but I made it to Princeton and Harvard. You know, our, the clarity of our analysis, you know, starts to dim. So what resisting state violence is trying to do, and I read the blurb from the library journal, it was, they had a little catch in that, well, if you actually agree with her politics, this might be useful. But what resisting state violence was trying to do was gesture towards the terror as mundane. And so it has these different chapters because I'm not doing my dissertation. My dissertation is on Hannah Arendt. I never published a book on Arendt. I have no intention to publish, I'm not interested, but I learned a lot, right? And I was trained by Jesuits and I think I was trained by Republicans, which is probably why I'm a rebel. You know, a rebel. But it was only an essay form that I could capture what I was seeing, right? In Nicaragua, in Harlem, and these various, in Panama, I went right before the invasion. And these zones of disposability, that would never register in the New York Times or Washington Post, no matter what series or prize winning Pulitzer or whatever. It was only if you were with the people, at least for me, that I better understood. And I didn't even have to leave the States. I just had to go to Harlem or I had to go to the South Bronx. I was an organizer for Bread for the World, which was you know, organizing with churches around food insecurity in the 1980s. Um, impoverished neighborhoods and, and the churches had these pantries, right? And so there was, a, there was a rupture between being in the neighborhoods or in the churches and then going to Washington, D.C. and then lobbying, right? You know, Congress about more money. And it was always then these ruptures, right? That, you know, just to be honest, <laughs> the ruptures infuriated me the rupture of the academy, the rupture of the elected politician, the rupture in which you've actually met the people and you realize no matter what we're talking about, it doesn't fully capture the reality on the ground and the desperation and the need 
for striking strategies. And I'm not talking about striking like, you know, militaristic, but, you know, again, I came from a military family, so it's not like I can actually erase that part of my brain. But striking the, the clarity of the need to move and to move with risk taking, right, is, is dimmed in the U.S. So I'm going to wrap with resisting safe violence. I talk about Foucault. Why? Because it's the Black activist women who are working class, who school me, even though I'm aligned with bourgeois women, number of them aligned with the Communist Party. And that's how I travel. This is how I meet Angela Davis, who blurbs, you know, does the forward, because I meet her in New York City, I meet her in Nairobi, I meet her in Moscow, right? And I never joined the party, but I'm moving around because I'm trying to be relevant. And I, I like their statements about human rights, children's rights, women's rights, right? So I'm reading what's on paper and I'm organizing around that. But it's the women who are organizing around police brutality in New York City and also these vigilante, white vigilante killings, right? In, in Bed-Stuy, in Brooklyn, in Harlem, in the Bronx, food insecurity, violence against women, racist violence. The police are, you know, just because you have a black mayor and a black woman police commissioner now in New York City, the NYPD is the NYPD. It's the largest, it's the most um, well-financed. It's also international and it also has an anti-terrorist component. So it is a paramilitary force, right? And often it just saw black teenagers, this is how you get the Central Park Five put in you know, jail for a crime they did not commit. It sees black youth as disposable or as super predators, which was that cliche. So it's the activists on the ground who teach me more than the philosophers in the academy. It's the activists who are working class and black who teach me more than the middle-class um, communists that I meet. It's the activists, I'll be honest, who teach me more than Union Seminary does. Because the activists, which, you know, decades later, I'm like, oh, they're captive maternals. They have a form of love, agape, right? They have the personal love, you know, for their family, the community love, but they have a form of, of love as political will that I don't see in these other sectors. And so they're the ones who give me the lens where I can critique Foucault. And I think it's the first critique of Foucault around racial erasure. I give the critique in a seminar led by Angela Davis at the History of Consciousness. And you know, other black grad students push back, like how dare you talk about Foucault? Because you know, they're indoctrinated in the academy that you know, European philosophers know everything. And it's like, because it doesn't make sense. We're black people. Like, how can you say that? the guillotine comes out of the square at this time when it's the height of lynching in the U.S. and Ida B. Wells is writing about it. So the clash and the contradiction is me seeking to be an academic and then becoming one. But knowing what little I know about impoverished people who are in war zones, either war zones outside the U.S. that are being engineered by the U.S., right, because we're imperialist or war zones inside the cities or even in the countryside, because there's food scarcity, there's housing scarcity, and there's violence. And it's internal violence too, how we violate in our families, how we violate in our communities. So that's what resisting state violence was for me in some ways. It was, I don't know, wasn't really a testimonial, wasn't really a journal. It was an attempt to try to make sense of what I was seeing. And it wasn't even intended like, oh, it's gonna get me tenure, but obviously it contributed to that. But nothing I've ever written has been about, oh, it's gonna get me tenure. Because there's something about, I only can say more about the communities I know. There's something about how we love and we risk when we love that pulls some of us, and including people on this call, to write, to scrutinize, and to organize as intellectuals without thinking about compensation. Like when nobody's trying to be famous, nobody's trying to be a thought leader. For me, it was just trying to be true, like a witness, like I saw stuff. Maybe I <laughs> wish I hadn't seen certain stuff, but I saw it. So now what am I gonna do about it?
I'm going to attempt to share and see if there's a possibility of us collectively theorizing and going forward. If we fast forward today, I don't feel that kind of connection. I thought, oh, maybe, you know, because I'm old, I'm older. And, you know, things happen when you age and you bury your parents and you try to raise kids, you adopt kids, you try to raise kids, you adopt. And it's like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And you just, you know, maybe it's exhaustion. But I don't see that connection with the youth that I talk to either. I just see their rage and their fury. And I see different formations because I teach in the Ivies, right? I mean, you know, before Williams, it was Brown, before that little stint at Columbia. And then I do the large state, you know, the tier one things, right? I think like, even if we talk, which is the second part when I'm supposed to be talking about this siege, we don't all see it the same way. I mean, I talk to people who are in the Black Panther Party and I think they have the height of the analytical, you know, framework because they they were targeted by COINTELPRO. They, they knew what it was like to, you know, have the government try to kill you or put you in prison for decades. And, you know, I would visit some of them. I anthologize them. But there's no agreement, even with what I think of as the most radical rebel sector, in terms of analysis of what happened in the Capitol siege on January 6, 2021, or how best to go forward, right? So I want to I'm not going to read to you because I feel that's a disservice. I want to talk about a couple of things that I think are maybe tangible. The move to the captive maternal and why I'm just wrapping myself around her or she's wrapping herself or they're wrapping. It's a non-gender formation. I'm wrapping myself around the captive maternal as a form of love that's conflicted. And I will get to that in a moment. I want to deal with the capital siege. So like I have all these quotes, but you, you follow the news. So you know what went down. Um, I worked on a tribunal in resisting state violence. I talk about, um, we charge genocide, you know, the, the document that was produced in 1951 with William Patterson, W.B. Du Bois and others. And in the early 1960s, Malcolm would take the same, same document and, and walk it over to the, the UN. So I helped convince this group of former political prisoners. And, you know, again, I was going inside to meet with them. It's like, we want to do a, 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 something called in the spirit of Nelson Mandela. We want to do a truth and reconciliation. And my argument, and I was going in to visit, you know, also with somebody who had been in the party in Harlem. Um, and so the Panthers on the East Coast, totally different from Huey P. Newton and the Panthers on the West Coast, who I consider to be um, predatory, you know. I mean, there's violence. Again, I'm from military. There's violence that's defense. And then there's violence that's opportunistic. And I think Oakland slid right into the opportunistic form of it. So when I look at the truth and reconciliation, I, I'm saying, and then you can tell me I'm wrong when I stop talking in six minutes. Um, I'm like, we can't do that because it doesn't make sense. There's nothing to reconcile with, right? And it's not just Trump. You can't blame everything on Trump. The democracy was going in this direction no matter what, right? Because it, it, the money was structured for it to go in that direction. The military is structured. I mean, a number of the white supremacists, according to Kathy Bellow, B-E-L-E-W, B -E -L -E -W, she started studying the vets as they were coming back from these wars. It was 20 years. You know, bogus, you know, weapons of mass destruction. You know, he didn't have them. But you could destable the Middle East and see if you can speculate around oil. So what do you do with the vet? There were like up to three suiciding a day. What happens when they find a noble cause? And that cause is to restore the democracy to pristine whiteness and patriarchy. And yeah, a good number of them found a noble cause and they came back trained killers. And I'll be honest, my dad was a trained killer. I mean, he served in Nam. He was an officer, right? So they come back with skills that civilians don't have. And you could say we shouldn't have them. I'm like, okay, but we don't really want to know about it. 
they're not civilians like no vets are not like everybody else once you start killing people you're not like everybody else okay and so you, this siege i'm talking to panthers who are also in, are engaged in militarized and i'm like we can't do truth and reconciliation because the war's not over the war's about to start i mean there were always these lynchings right but at the way the way in which they're organizing underground and then for Bella, they came above ground. She's at University of Chicago. You could Google her work and look at her book. I, I highly recommend it. But there was no consensus. So, I mean, it's like, okay, why don't we try a tribunal about we charge genocide? And then they shift to that. But when they shift to that, it's more of a catalog of grievances and rightly so. But they, but you know, again, I could be a hypercritic. We can't rely on the United Nations. I mean, I used to work at the UN Methodist Women's Center across from the UN, and we would teach tours, like tutorial. You know, we get the Methodist kids and adults from all over the country, and they're in hotels in New York, and then we're going to take them to the UN for the tour, and then we're going to do a seminar on national politics and international politics. That's what I did for a couple of years before I went to seminary, right? So that's still playing within structure, but structure has betrayed us. The, you know, it's that real estate's really expensive. They're never going to oppose the United uh, States because they're paying, you know, we don't even pay, we're in arrears, we don't even pay on time. But the United Nations, with all its good intentions, is not the model to go forward. And so when law itself is not working for you, what is the imagination and what is the agape? And that leads me to um, the captive maternal. So I started thinking about the captive maternal, like, you know, I did the Angela Davis reader, I did the black feminist reader. I mean, it was a black feminist forever, like for decades, right? And importantly so, because of violence against women, domestic violence, um, the sexual assaults, the trafficking. And then later I found out, you know, 40% of the children sex trafficked are boys and they undercount. So children are the most um, fragile as we know, most vulnerable. So there's probably boys are sexually trafficked as much as girls are. We just don't have the data on it or complete data on it, right? So I was trying to think like, if you love your community, despite its contradictions, and you will be faithful to your religion despite its contradictions, because it says one thing on paper and then it like, you know, sectors of it sign off on these horrible wars, then what would bind us together? And that's when the captive maternal came up. And so I'm just, and that was only in the last couple of years. So I'm gonna quickly read this and it's not gonna be all of it, it's gonna stop. And it's from a manuscript called Fulcrum, the captive maternal leverages democracy. And so this is a section and it's titled to be or not to be a captive maternal question. Is that really a question option? The captive maternal as a function, not an identity is not equivalent to the formal employment sector or of or, or unpaid jobs and domestic reproduction of your own homes or those of others who hire you as their nandies and elder care providers. We saw a lot of that in New York City when COVID hit, right? Like people were asked to leave their families to take care of the families, the young and the elderly and the fragile of the wealthy. The captive maternal is a vocation or a choice, not always a voluntary one, undertaken whether monetary compensation materializes. And even if it does, it can never compensate for the trauma, emotional or intellectual labor and the theft of labor. During the 2020 COVID pandemic in the US, over 850,000 women permanently left the job force or lost their jobs, including women who had white existential wealth, elite education, and function as attorneys and CEOs. Through 500 years of enslavement, exploitation, extraction, warfare, and alienated natality, countless black women, men, and children lost their minds. The essential workers deemed expendable and caretaking for this democracy have a difficult journey, which we refuse to share given our disparate 
ideologies and inabilities or lack of political will to shred the 13th Amendment penal clause and the 14th Amendment being repurposed to grant political personhood largely to white male led corporations while voter suppression ramps up to deplete the democratic agency of blacks. Stop the steal charges were largely directed against black cities such as Detroit and Philadelphia. Ready to retire after working until 10 p.m. one night, I heard the ping alert to the last work email before rest. I glanced at the new entry. The headline of a recent Truthout interview appeared under you know, the larger heading, quote, reaching beyond black faces in high places, end quote, and above a photo of a masked Vice President Kamala Harris posing presidential. Although I had uttered only few lines about the Vice President in the interview, the email that was being sent to me was about that, those particular lines. The sender who identified herself only as capital BPLR appended to the truth out headline, her own subtitle, quote, exhausted with all the BS, end quote. I opened her email, BPLR, an older black woman from New York, so she told me, scolded me. I am not a politician. This is the highest position a woman of black extraction has ever held. Hold on, stop the stuff. Let us see where this goes. We have been in the SH and then asterisk T for years, taking it both ways. Please take a breath and stop killing my per present buzz, end quote. My response from one captive maternal to another was immediate and brief with a little reference to my republic and my affinity for its reinventions in the absence of ending imperial and domestic warfare. I emailed back, quote, not trying to kill your buzz, enjoy the election. I was excited about Obama too, and then saw the policies impact. Political analysis is not for popularity or comfort, stay well, end quote. I, I wrote as if civility would keep this republic intact. Historically, captives and fugitives painted political ethics and theory so that maroon philosophy could map freedom along the contours and fault lines of colonial and imperial democracies. When early rebellions and multiracial maroonage receded to leave only blackness at democracy's outermost borders, that blackness solidified into the silhouette of the black matrix as a basic boundary between domination and power between the violence of productive labor for the marketplace and the terror that reproduces, quote, plantation babies, end quote. Encompassing democracy's anti-Black animus and Maronage's anti-Black feminist sentiments, the Black matrix boasts points to and constitutes uncharted territory on the other side of democracy. Its objective is to destabilize democracy's mythology, Amara Naj's demystifications as a form of pleasure as well as justice. And I just want to end by saying that about a year or so ago, I was asked to speak on a panel at the Newburgh, Newburgh, New York, LGBTQ forum. It was a round table for Attica. And we all know about the Attica rebellion, the horrific violence that Governor Rockefeller, after a conversation with President Nixon, unleashed against the incarcerated using Vietnam era military weapons in the hands of the National Guard, who shot through white prison guards as hostages to kill largely black rebels. And based on Orasami Burton's work, who I think you should really check out this young scholar Burton, he's doing an incredible book on Attica. After the retaking of the prison, the guards handed the leaders over to uh, the National Guard handed the leaders over to prison guards and they engaged in more torture and then they murdered people, right? So when I was talking to the LGBTQ center, I was saying to them that I belong to a church in Manhattan. I mean, I'm not in Manhattan right now. Actually, I have two churches. This one was led by um, white Lutheran women. And they had a... Um, a sanctuary, like overnight stay in the basement. It was the only one for trans, um, it was only one for trans um, youth in New York City. And it's a city of over 8 million people. And we know what happens to trans youth, how they're pushed out and then they go into the sex economy, right? I mean, they have to eat, right? So upstairs, 
and, and they're not told that they have to go to service or anything like that. They just come in at night, you know, they, they have a kitchen, they have beds, you know, they put things away, they leave in, in, in the morning, then whatever they do for the day. Can you hold on just one second? I have a teen knocking. Joy will be back with us momentarily, I'm sure. I uh, don't quite understand what the interruption is. Um, but um, you, this will give you a little time to uh, get your thoughts together for the uh, discussion that will follow shortly. And Sorry to interrupt, I'm back. That was my Captain Maternal moment. Everything's a crisis. Okay, so, sorry, upstairs in this sanctuary, because it's an old church, it's a white alabaster angel, it's about five, six feet statue. But in her arms, it's what the youth produce, which was a cross that was about five feet of photographs of murdered black trans women, right? Who were beautiful and glamorous, and violently transition. And so that was their former prayer. And there's no way every time you walk to your pew, you had to pass the cross. And so I asked at the, the, the Newburgh Center, what does is, what is security look like for you? What does sanctuary look like for you? I mean, you're there at night, 15 out of what, how many thousands of trans and queer kids in, in New York City? And then you, you're kicked out in the day because New York City has laws. You can't, you, there's a time limit. You can shelter them because they want them to go to public shelters, which are dangerous and violent, right? And when I raised that to the LGBTQ and some of them had been incarcerated and they were trans women and they were blonde, they were predominantly, they were white. Um, it was just stone silence. Like they couldn't, they couldn't articulate their need to be safe. And I was like, what's your plan? And again, I grew up in the military. There's always a plan. And I'm, you know, honest, I grew up around guns. I'm not saying that's what you should do. I don't have any, but it's like, there's a plan, right? And so I said, okay, you want me to talk about Attica? Cause then they stopped talking. There's like, pretend like James isn't on the panel. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's, let's talk about Attica. I said, stage one of the captive maternal, you're a trustee. What do you do? you reproduce the prison because you're forced to, you're captive, like at Rikers. If they're gonna make you mop and clean and work in the laundry and like cook food, it's all feminized labor, right? And all the people inside male prisons are not really identified, self-identified as men, but that's the way they're gonna be categorized. You do this care. And Orsami Burton talks about Attica. He's like, the folks inside would sing songs to each other to calm their nerves. They kind of like no aggression against each other. You know, like we need the New York Times to show up. That was Tom Wicker. We were going to ask Bobby Seale to show up from the Black Panthers, et cetera, et cetera. But until they get to that stage of, of rebellion or resistance, they reproduce the prison. The prison can't exist without their labor. And then the second stage, they're like, wait, I'm going to protest this. Stage two, the captive maternal. Don't call me the N-word. Don't pay me 27 cents. Don't call me boy. 
don't make me do X, Y, and Z. Stop like threatening to put me in solitary confinement so I can have a nervous breakdown or go psychotic. And the protests are never enough because even when you sit at the table and they negotiate with you, they negotiate the terms of power based on the fact that they have leverage, which is why the book is called Leverage. I'm trying to re-leverage away from the state back into the community, right? And then by level three, stage three, they're like, we've met, we've like written petitions, you're ignoring us. So now, you know, it's not gonna be a literary or intellectual protest. Now we're, we're gonna go on strike. And this is tied to George Jackson's death in San Quentin. But again, the abolitionists are nervous about George Jackson because he was a militarist, but they were reading Soledad Brother inside prison. They're still reading it today. And so, there's a strike, there's a food strike. They, I mean, they stop eating, they stop working. And if you listen to um, the West Coast, what happened in the West Coast, the women's prisons, they went on strike too. They refused to come out of their cells. The only thing they had was to take their agency back from the prison, right? And then they take hostages, which, you know, judgment call, a lot of people, most people would never do. But that becomes a catalyst. And in some ways, you know, on that stage, when they take hostages and they build a fortress inside a prison, that is Maranaj. Those are the Maroons that I was talking about. And I've said in other places, historically, we ran for the swamps, the hills, we were just trying to get away. It's, you know, maximum security prison, but they create an education site, a food site, a medical site a cultural site, they recreate a world inside a fortress, which is the embodiment of predation. And then what does the state do? It treats the bid for freedom as a declaration of war. So you bring in the National Guard with Vietnam military hardware, and they shoot to kill, including other white men, because they're expendable. Because the point I believe of terror is to impact the psyche and to immobilize you. Like even when you're organizing, this is the way I feel sometimes, I can't think with clarity because I keep, I'm like nervous. I'm like a, you know, skittish, you know, look over there, here's the proud boys and who's doing that over like, what are the cops doing, et cetera, et cetera. But to the extent that the captive maternal is willing to go through all phases in order to find a liberation that expresses agape, I have faith. And that is why I'm still a feminist, but I no longer define myself within the conventional politics, which were the basis of what I wrote when I did resisting state violence. Okay, I'm sure that there are many questions that people have like to raise for discussion. Uh, <clears throat> let me start by pointing out that those who might be watching this on YouTube um, can get your questions to us um, by emailing me at global.justice.cliff at gmail.com and I'll pass your questions on uh, to Joy here in the Zoom room. Those who are in the Zoom room, of course, uh, you can present your questions um, directly. Um, I have my screen on gallery view so I can see everybody who's here. And if you have a question or comment, um, you just need to wave at me and uh, I'll allow you to unmute. Let me in. I'm waiting. Oh, man. <laughs> man. Okay. Anyone? Um, Anyone want to? Uh... Okay. Um, 
Reverend Andrew, um, where are you here? Okay, you can unmute. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Joy. Your analysis is uh, very multifaceted. Um, I've been wondering a lot about, I, I think you said some really powerful things. I think this whole idea of troubled vets finding a noble cause in restoring democracy is an interesting lens on the January 6th kind of, I don't even think insurrection maybe is the right word. I've been thinking a lot about it as vigilantism and this kind of maybe as a more useful framework. And I'm just thinking about if that's the narrative um, and there's such a commitment to uh, this understanding of kind of the corruption of the system which is in sync with a lot of the radical analysis from the left. Is there some, do you see a creative intersect um, that kind of calls upon that desire for restoring democracy that can adequately resist this trust in violence as the solution? Because I just, I just see what's happening in the political world right now um, where we've just become so convinced that the system is broken that we justify violence and we do that on both sides. And I'm wondering if there's a way, I want to use the word co-opt, but maybe that's too problematic, to, to take the desire to um, undermine or maybe the desire to overthrow the government and transform it into a desire to undermine systems of domination that are really based in capitalistic exploitation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Irvin Andrew. Yeah, what you put on the table is really important. I, I have a couple of responses to it, right? So when I talk to other colleagues of mine who are black feminist, they tell me the, the, the fastest growing demographic to buying guns that they are, are black women. I'm stuttering as I say it, right? Um, because of fear, you know? And that's different from you want to start a militia. No, that is like simply, I want to make it, I would need to stay alive to raise my kids. You know, I need to make it home from work, you know. And so there's no trust in the police or in the military apparatus. You just, it's your go-to place because nobody wants to have a private militia, right? So I think it's asymmetrical. Like, and I've also from people I was in seminary with, um, different for me because white affluent women who were at Union too, right? I think we were one of the first cohort of, of feminists, you know, going through Union, right? And, and dealing with the patriarchy there, but also trying to figure out like, based on our lived experience as women and who've been, you know, subjected to different forms of violence, you know, mostly for men, like, how's this going to be different? And so one person I dearly love and she stayed, I left early, but she stayed for the doctorate. She became a co-executive director of an organization in Harlem, which was on domestic violence. And we, we've been talking, you know, we're not, I'm not in the city so much, but she put something on the table that I had to grapple with. She says like self-defense is not violence. And I'm like, wait, so if that works for women when they're being battered, this is when I start talking about the parents, um, patria uh, in locos parentes, you know, about the state as the parental authority, as the arch patriarch. If you, if it, you know, I've said this on the millennials are killing capitalism podcast, which went way too long, like almost three hours. But I'm like, so in the home, you know, you burn the casserole, he's going to break your jaw. Or if you try to leave, you know, then he may like put your kids in the water or, you know, so so you stay. So is there some kind of parallel presentation of intimidation and terror happening in prisons? And for the people I know in prisons, that's absolutely true. Then it's like, well, is it happening outside of prisons? And to what degree? And what do you have as a right for self-defense? Because it's tricky. Literally, if you fight him, you know, and I've worked around domestic violence and other stuff. You know, I mean, I was in a space training in a women's dojo and I'll just be, I'll just be real with y'all. And like, they're training us and we're doing all this like, you know, security stuff or all the right kind of marches, but we can't have, it's only our bodies. We can't carry anything. And we're supposed to get in between, like if the cops are gonna ram a car into somebody or hecklers, 
you know, or homophobes are going to attack. We like put your body right there. That's your job. But we're also told, well, if you're being, um, if trigger for people going to talk about sexual violence, if you're being raped, just go limp. And we're like, wait, we don't agree to those terms. But they're like, if you fight him, he'll probably kill you. And it's, and then it's like, those are my uh, those are my options. But we didn't agree internally. We agreed to our sensei, who was you know a white lesbian trained by Black Panthers. <laughs> like we'll like we're, we went to the Central Park case, sat in on a trial. We did everything right, but we agreed on certain political things, but we couldn't agree on personal terror. Like, what is the right response? And do you just like, well, I'm just going to endure and hope you don't choke me out. And people are like, no, we're going to fight out. I mean, different people had different responses. Our communities are the same way. Like the fear is what keeps at least our communities I mean, they're, the kids are shooting up each other. I mean, I'm not pretending that's not happened. But in terms of people who are trying to organize, it's the fear of being targeted. I mean, they didn't do COINTELPRO just for the 60s and 70s. They're like, we want you to remember COINTELPRO for the next 100 years. And we don't care if you're a pacifist or militarist. I mean, they spied on King. They wrote letters suggesting he commits suicide, you know, because he was having extramarital affairs. And then who killed Malcolm X, the documentaries, you know, the NYPD and, and the feds were, you know, probably inciting like that mosque in New Jersey to kind of do what it did. So for people who were largely the recipients of violence, I have a hard time telling them what they're supposed to do. Just like when our sensei tells us, you're just going to have to, you know, just survive it. And some of the women are like, no, nah, I'm no. And also, you know, I'm a survivor of like, you know, incest or something. No, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna try another way. And it's like, you're probably gonna end up dead. And they're like, eh, this is my, you know, my odds. You have whole communities of youth who feel the exact same way. They have been abandoned. They've been lied to by the official prestigious left. And I'm gonna be clear, and I don't care if I'm snarky. <laughs> There's this moment now where you can make real money on black suffering, right? Because they threw hundreds of millions. I mean, the corporations just threw money at everything. They don't give you that money to be a rebel. They give you that money to quiet it down. And so I'm okay, right? Because if I don't want to be in the city, I'll be in a house upstate and the kids will be banging on the door, but they're not going to get COVID. And they're not going to have, you know, drive by, you know, shootings. The gangs are not going to get to them. They're going to be in private schools or they're going to go where white middle class, you know, that's a sector of the black community that betrayed the rest of the community. Because we couldn't take them with us. Right. And we really don't want to moving into our homes or our neighborhoods. We don't plan to share that much, but we lecture to them. And I don't want to be defeatist and say, I, you know, do what you need to do, stay alive, feed your kids. But unless we had a strategy and we disciplined ourselves to that and we acknowledge that we cannot contain the terror of the state or the militia, because here's the deal that, you know, from Michael Flynn, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't just the guys who got, it's Michael Flynn and it's part of the military. And just because you have a black man in head of the Pentagon doesn't work that way. I grew up in Texas on those bases. Those are free thinking people. They don't care. They will, you know, they will shoot white cops. They, they don't care. They did Branch Davidian. David Koresh, it was like you could have arrested, they, but you know, they they believe they're sovereign and free. Black people know that we're captive. And we just want to live long and, you know, not be crushed. So I don't know how we get equilibrium on that scale. Does that make sense? Okay. We have a question that has come in from, uh, uh, from a YouTube viewer. And uh, let me just put it up here for you all to read. It comes from... Doug Morris, uh, philosopher. Hi, Doug. Good to have you back. He writes, I live in rural Pennsylvania, working class neighbors, where one sees plenty of Confederate flags um, 
uh, flying in the back of pickup trucks, Trump, Trump 2024 flags on front lawns, Blue Lives Matter lawn signs, etc. Boy, doesn't he have interesting neighbors? Um, a neighbor told me the other day that he attends nightly the University of Tucker Carlson. Tucker has taught him to believe that criti critical race theory has two goals. One, make all black and native people seek to be pitied. And two, teach all white people they are oppressors who should live in a state of constant guilt. I've noticed too that some university students are also attending uh, Fucker's classes. Uh, no, excuse me, Tucker's classes. And they too <laughs> have reduced cr uh, critical race theory to these points. Any advice on engaging people on these matters? People who have been indoctrinated by Tucker and Fox News and ideologies of white supremacy. Thanks for the vital, vital, vital ideas shared in the presentation. In peace and solidarity, Doug Morris. <laughs> Thank you, Doug Morris. So I know people who are in the party, meaning the Panther Party, and who risk their lives. I mean, because people are coming to kill them. And as Sophia Bukhari, I brought her to speak at Brown years ago, and she transitioned early. She had been incarcerated for eight years, had a forced hysterectomy. People in the weather underground tell me that she died from grief, right? And that happens. I think that's happened a lot that people are just transitioning, you know, before their time. But the people I know, you know, I talked to some of them on the phone and they they have somebody who moved in across the street and they're flying that stuff, not quite the Confederate flag, it's New Jersey. I've, I've been to Penn State a couple of times to talk and yeah, that's a really interesting place. Um, they don't, they'll put on something subtle. They're not gonna counter with some strong, flag against another flag because they've got grandkids they've got you know again it's the captain maternal thing you know we got to take care of our kids we've got to survive this and these are zealots you know when i was at McAllister a couple of years ago i was channeling bulo's book saying you know this is a for them it's a holy war right because you know, I grew up in Texas with the Confederate flags and you had to be careful like when you stepped off the curb, even if the light said you could cross because they'd speed up the truck and then you jump back on. It's like, really, were we doing this? And yeah, they're doing it. So we never sought a direct confrontation and I didn't think that was cowardice. I just thought that was like prudent. But then I knew some people who were just like, I'm done with it. And they, they were like, we're just going to have a confrontation. And then that kind of forces you to choose who you're going to support, you know, and, and clearly try to protect. So back to the Holy War, I mean, so I went to church, it's called chapel on military bases. So there's the flag and, and, you're, and your preacher, pastor, whatever, he's a captain. And, you know, we're singing those songs. I'm going to Bible school and I'm teaching Bible school. It's love of God and love of country. They're not separated. They're the same thing. And so you can't critique the US for capitalism and imperialism because, oh my gosh, you're a communist and you're anti God. So you're anti, you're the Antichrist, where you're some manifestation of it. So navigating that and still have, being true to your politics, I just increasingly worked with the people that needed help the most, not the ones who are the most adversarial. I know that there's elite leadership who are saying we have to do the listening tours and we have to talk to people and we have to make that connection. I'm fine with that. I just know I'm not one of those people unless those students actually end up in my class. I'm not seeking out those communities. And also what I mentioned at McAllister when I was there I was on this panel with Eddie Zing, who's Chinese American, who did quite a number of years he never killed anybody, but in prison, he went in when he was 16. He's an abolitionist in California. When I call them the holy wars, it's because when I was growing up and, you know, I was, you know, we're playing the guitar and we're singing gospel songs in the park. So we were Jesus freaks. I think that's what they called us. 
it was the rapture was going to be that Christ was going to return and only take the worthy. They rewrote the program. The rapture requires ethnic cleansing now. It's like Jesus <laughs> only comes back. And I was joking, it wasn't funny, but it's like put on a t shirt Jesus wants a genocide. Jesus only comes back after they cleanse the world. I was like, what are you going to do, nuke everybody? And like, they can't pull it off, but they can do some real damage. And if we lose the midterm elections and gee whiz, if Trump comes back in, because nobody really goes to prison for their crimes, right? Their crimes against the state. I mean, if you're Eric, I mean, Snowden, Edward Snowden, yeah, you do. So you have to flee Julian Sanch. I mean, if you're a whistleblower, and this happened a lot under Obama, he put the most stringent laws against whistleblowers that, based on my research that any other president ever did, including George W. Bush, who had a lot to hide. So what do you do with violence when it's next door? What do you do with violence when it's your neighbor? I mean, in part, I think people hope, like, I hope you just don't come into my yard or cross over. But we all know that's insufficient. And we, you know, and my sense from the youth, they're going to do their own thing because they don't think we have an answer. And actually listening to, you know, because like I know everybody for whatever reason, I know all the famous people who quote lead us. When I listen to them, I'm getting confused with the freedom dreams. Like, I'm kind of like, what's the material reality here? And you want people to be pacifists, but can you control um, the insurrectionists? And you can't, and you don't even talk about them. So they're, you know, the restorative justice I believe in, the therapy I believe in, but they're talking about black people fixing ourselves. If we're just kinder to ourselves, we can love each other and put down every kind of weapon. That's that's not a, a get out of terror card. It doesn't work that way. So I don't, we would have to redefine courage and hopefully protection. And I, obviously we would have to do that collectively. But the youth are already, I would believe me, the youth are doing, I don't even wanna know what they're doing. And like, think about this, right? And T, when Cornel West, cause I track him like, cause he taught me. So when he's in Charlottesville, when you lose Heather Heyer, right? Because they murdered her. And then some people go to jail, but prison, but it, that's not, you know, that was just the tip of the iceberg, right? With the tiki tortures and stuff. But Cornell clearly said in multiple talks that Antifa saved his life and that of the clergy. I haven't seen anybody pick that up because Antifa is not pacifist. So what does that mean? This is when it's getting really gnarly. And I'm like, what do you tell the kids? And I just stopped talking to them. It's just, just read the book. Because, you know, do they're gonna do, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. And from the years I spent trying to support political prisoners, I know that agency and freedom are lifeblood to some people who feel dishonored, alienated, and with a target on them. So the best I can do is write and support them once they're in prison. My preference is that they never have to go to prison, right? But we we weren't consistent about getting Mumia Abu-Jamal out. Lena Peltier has COVID now. Russell Maroon Schultz was released like four weeks before he died from stage four cancer. Like all the people who fought, it's almost like we're afraid of them because they fought. Well, I'm, I'm not one of those people. I don't fight like that. I'm, you know, petty bourgeois. I'll write a check, you know, contribute to your defense fund. But I can't forget that people fought. No matter how we feel about it, they fought. So what is our relationship to them? Okay. I see um, Jürgen Ahers. His hand is up. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, throughout the presentation, you, you raised the rhetorical question, where is the agape? 
and um, that question resonates with me. Um, early in your presentation, you talked about the zones of disposability. And I was intrigued by that, that concept. And you use Nicaragua and Harlem, and I, I'm assuming zones of disposability can be multiplied ad infinitum. Um, to include, of course, prisons, but also people, individual people, um, that they're disposable <laughs> by the sheer fact of the color of their skin or their level uh, of poverty or whatever. So I'm, I'm curious, where do you find the agape? Ah, thank you. So two things. First, the zones of disposability and agape. My understanding of the captive maternal is that they, we, as an ungendered phenomena, is baked into the democracy. The three-fifth clause doesn't give race. It's other people. But we were the three-fifth clause. And that's how disproportionately you got Southern plantation investors or owners to be presidents of the United States. Because in the US, our elections are determined by the Electoral College. That's why Hillary Clinton can have 2 million votes more than Donald Trump, and Donald Trump becomes president. Because the Electoral College, it's a Ponzi scheme, I would call it, but it's built upon accumulation through the ownership of people. So every time Sally Hemings, you know, Thomas Jefferson, it's, you know, it's Thomas Jefferson's late wife, half sister, who is a slave and a 14 year old when she starts having babies by Thomas Jefferson. Every time she has a baby, Thomas Jefferson is getting closer to defeating John Adams in the 1800 presidential election. John Adams is an abolitionist. And he wasn't the greatest. I don't care if he's great or not. He was just opposed to slavery. But you're going to get Thomas Jefferson. And then you're going to get, you know, his books that he writes that, you know, dishonor indigenous, but say, well, maybe we could save them if we just like kill their religions and culture and make them Christian. But he says, black people, we're, we're not human. This is why Afro-pessimism emerges. And I know people like to throw garbage at it, but they just take it to the hardcore. You know, Afro-pessimism is real because it's an anti-black world, right? So the zones of disposability come hardest on the indigenous and those considered black. So when that, what is it, climate thing was going on, which, you know, a couple of months ago, and I'm listening to Democracy Now! and Amy Goodman says, there have been over a thousand environmental activists that have been murdered since 2015, and a third of them are indigenous. I'm like, there's not that many indigenous people surviving to, to you know, have that, those kind of high number counts. But it's like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Because the, the last of the pristine lands, right, are part of their holdings in the Amazons, in the Dakotas, right? But if they're not fully recognized as human, killing them is easy for killers. It's harder to kill a white person and walk. It just is. That's how it is in the U.S. You know, you kill a white person, especially if they have money, it's like, wait, what happened? Let's have an investigation. You can't have mass lynchings of whites. You can't steal white land like that. African Americans had, you know, 20% of the land that was farming land at the turn of the 20th century belonged to blacks. Today it's 1%. We didn't give that land away. It wasn't even our land, it was indigenous land. But we like, you know, we got shot up for it. We, you know, it's the constant accumulation through extraction of the so-called non-human. The United States is, is a white supremacist democracy. And it's not going to be like the Athenian polis that you can like over the generations move out of slavery because you got caught in war. They built this concept of race in order to accumulate. And it's brilliantly done and it's demonic. And so everybody suffers, but not everybody dies the way we die. And the fact that this democracy I was talking to somebody the other day, that we're the political theology network was doing something and somebody's like, you're not a real political theologian. It's like, I never said I was anything but an activist. But like, 
you can't accumulate this kind of wealth without organization. If it was free, you know, ranging terror, it would just be too messy. If you can identify a people that are disposable and look at the, our quote, emancipation, betrayal and reconstruction, the convict prison lease system, and I'll leave this one, I'll stop and go to the next agape. The convict prison lease system emerges after we're technically free, but we're freed by the 13th amendment which legalizes involuntary servitude, which is slavery, if you've been duly convicted of crime. Do you know, you know how they threw down on this, right? They just started arresting us. Like, oh, you're, you're on a sidewalk when a white person wants to, oh, you stole a chicken. And it wasn't just the South. It was the investment bankers in the North who were going to rebuild the South and make a ton of money right? And timber, lumber, railroads. It was, this is how, you know, capitalism got its next spring. So we lived longer when we were legally slaves because they worked us to death. There are books that historians have written called One Dies Get Another because it was a joint venture. We no longer belong to a private quote owner who had to maintain, like you maintain your car or your house. We were now the property of the state the state will work you to death and then go kidnap your nephew and replace you. But if you had to pay $300 for some person, you need them to stay alive so you get your investment back. The state has no investment in Black people. Agape. I have to that long intro. I'm like, oh yeah, having just what I said, what is agape under those conditions? So the Afro pessimists don't believe in agape. I mean, they believe in love and, you know, they have white moms and white partners, but the architects, Frank Wilderson, Jarrett Sexton, they're the key ones, they're women. I brought them to Brown when they were grad students and I could see this unfolding. And Lewis Gordon, you know, when he comes, he hates them, right? And Lewis was my colleague at Brown. But I'll tell you, I respect Frank Wilderson and Jarrett Sexton because they took the risk. They, they looked at Gramsci, they looked at Marx, they looked at Lacan, they looked, you know, and then they looked at how we live. And some people say, well, nobody wants to organize under that, it's nihilism. No, Calvin Warren is a nihilist. They're more like intellectual insurrectionists. Do they love? Yes. Do they love everybody? I don't know. The agape I'm talking about is I'm trying to figure out how to love. I, I, I'm not an expert on it, I'm just working at it. The copy that I'm thinking about, what I heard Pastor Jordan said as political will, will not be because I'm going to get any return on it. It's not going to be about pleasure. It's not going to be about feeling that people love me back. It's not even going to be that anybody's going to remember me when I transition. It is simply that to stay true to something greater than myself, this will be, as I hear from my pastor, a sacrificial love. And this will be the highest form of love. And I don't know if it's true, but I'm going for it. And when I talk to the kids, I just like, I can't stop them from doing whatever they plan to do because I can't protect them, right? But what I can say is that I love you. Not that I know you, but that I love you. And because I love you, I'm willing to take certain risks, not all risks. I got like a 13 year old, I got to take care of people. And stuff. I can't disappear, but I can take certain risks outside of my comfort zone. And hopefully that if you know, I love you, that will be sufficient for something. There was a podcast I did with a black miss and people are like, you have to be pragmatic, you know, in the chat. And I wasn't watching, I watched it later. And they were, it was like, who is Angela Davis kind of thing, right? Because you can also have your movements sold back to you as simulacra. And I ended by saying, I could be wrong, but I'm going to go for it. Our ancestors loved us so much, they risked everything. Martin Luther King could have had a quiet little church somewhere, right? But then he comes out against imperialism in the Vietnam War and he becomes a problem and the black middle class and the Ford Foundation abandon him, right? Malcolm X could have said, okay, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, 
mess me over, but I'm just going to do so. No, nobody took the money. Nobody rejected the risk. And I believe it wasn't out of arrogance. It was out of love. And so that, when I think of Agape, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, Che Guevara, and they include militarists, Patrice Lumumba, people in our own families, like the people who took risk modeled Agape. And for the argument that we need to be pragmatic all the time, because we, my position was, well, fewer of us would be alive. And it was our risk taking that changed this democracy. That's how you got voting rights, civil rights, you know, the change of immigration, everything, I'm going to claim it, even if I'm wrong, everything that transitioned to like improve this democracy is because people got lynched and bombed and murdered in the civil rights movement and later in the Black Power movement and the American Indian movement and the Chicano movement. I mean, they, they bombed, they blew up cars in Colorado. Like, it's great that Cesar Chavez, you know, lived, I mean, all those hunger strikes, you know, shortened his life, but a lot of people died violently. So the ancestors love us. And so they do risky things like Mamie Till Mobley has that open casket funeral for a 14 year old mutilated kid. Nobody does that, that like is a breach. But we know we're loved because they risk. And I wouldn't wanna be a people that nobody loved enough to take a risk for, right? I would rather be loved that way than be pragmatic in a conventional political way. I really appreciate your question because it just pushed me to get like as clear as I want to be about it, what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, right? Um, I, I might uh, just pose a question here. Um, we see the, you know, the opposition to uh, um, to teaching black history, um, the opposition, you know, it, even to the point uh, of passing laws mm -hmm. that, uh, that um, well, I guess the next step is for them to outlaw Black History Month. Uh, but uh, or to ban uh, it in state, yeah, state by state. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I'm right. from Texas, yeah. And, and so what I'm thinking is, uh, you know, white supremacy is on the offensive. Mm -hmm. um, Trump helped bring them, bring the cockroaches out of the woodwork. And, uh, and now I'd like to hear your thoughts as to how effective our uh, resistance or our fight back to that, uh, that yeah. resurgence of white supremacy can be. Well, Oh, man. I want to say something more optimistic. I'm just going to pass that one for a second because Kyle Rittenhouse came to mind, right? Kyle Rittenhouse shot three white men, right? And that kind of gets glossed over. But when I look at it, it's like, okay, that makes sense. The point is for whites not to become militant anti-racist. I don't think people really care what you privately think, you know? I mean, you could teach, you know, critical race theory to your own grandchildren or nephews and nieces and buy some books on Amazon. But the point is like, what does it mean to be an ally? I mean, if you take that seriously, you're gonna be on somebody's list. And that's why I mentioned Cornell saying, you know, that Antifa saved his life. But you know, Antifa got crushed because the FBI, along with Trump, I mean, what are they? I mean, I don't know who they are personally, but yeah, actually I do know some of them, but they're young people and they're white. And they're like, we're gonna be allies and we're gonna put you know, our bodies between, this is what I was talking about when I was in the women's dojo. You're trained, you put your body between the civilians, right? And the wannabe you know, thugs you know, and assassins. So it's sacrificial anyway, somebody's gonna get beat up. It's supposed to be you. We are just women, so we were like, this would be interesting because, you know, we were gender non-conforming. There's always been white revolutionaries and they've been, they've been across the spectrum just like there've been black revolutionaries. But there's also been this large inertia 
of white people who are just afraid to move. Whereas even if we have a large inertia of black people afraid to move, like after you bomb a Birmingham church with four girls in it because they're because you put the bomb in the women's in the girls' bathroom, right? In 1963. And Angela talks about that. I mean, she wasn't there, she was in France, but you know, everybody, it's horrific. Spike Lee, you know, four little girls is his documentary. Black people are so we know what it means when a white supremacist shows up. I'm not sure that white people know what it means. I think like like some literary, oh, it's bad manners or Joe Rogan, you shouldn't have said the N word so many times. Plus you like lied about COVID, stuff like that. So, I mean, it's been centuries, but it feels like white people are still figuring it out. You know, white supremacy is, is 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 a death sentence. That's all it is. I mean, the black bourgeoisie kind of figured out how they could live longer. Like we move into white neighborhoods and our kids to white schools, da, 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 da. But, you know, for a mass, it's just, you know, if you're lucky and you get to be that scholarship kid who goes to Harvard, good for you, because you're not going to move back into the neighborhood. And I've already said, I don't, I may live on the cusp of the neighborhood, but I don't live in the quote hood. And when I'm like, okay, get, get in the car, we're going north in a really hostile, affluent county, um, really hostile, but we're on land. On a private, I don't have to see anybody if I don't want to, right? That's not how the vast majority live. And white, they're poor white people. And they're white people who have lied. White people, that Mara Naj included a lot of Irish. Robin Kelly talks about this. The Irish as indentured were running to, just like the indigenous and the Africans to get away from these settlers. But Robin Kelly says, you know, they promised the Irish and the Scots, like, here's some land and here's some guns, like, just stay with us. Once they figured out we're not going to, you know, we can't, like, treat an indentured Irish person the way we treat an African. Because once we do that, then whites are like, yeah, let's just leave or do something else. Let's take over, right? We're not we're not there. And it's a lot of hard work to get get there. And then I would argue that the most radical black people don't trust white people at all. It doesn't matter that they're married into them and their mom's white, they don't care. Like they've moved to an ideological space. It's like, they're going to be liberals. And if they're liberals, they're going to betray you. And they don't trust black elites either because their position is they betrayed us. It's not just about, you got, you know, multimillion dollar homes or something like that. Every time the radicals try to like say, emperor has no clothes on and you can't keep trusting electoral politics because they're rigging the game, which is voter suppression, electoral college could go on and on. The black elite said, be quiet and line up to vote. So now you you have these free agents and I don't even know how we would come to the table since nobody trusts each other. I mean, I think it's like all of us, you have to figure out your tolerance for suffering because of, like having grown up around white supremacists, the only thing that spared me, my father was an officer. That's why you couldn't mess with me and my siblings because there was a chain of command. You don't have that in the civilian world unless you're a millionaire or billionaire. There's no chain of command or your, your dad's like the chief of police, but there've been black cops who've been shot because when white cops roll up, they just see blackness. They don't like, I was trying to like, you know, ward off the perpetrator. It's like, no, you were black with a gun. I shot you, right? We would, I just feel we would, we have to rethink everything. That's why I keep saying I have no answers. And then we have to love everybody, but I don't trust everybody. I will love everybody, but I'm not going to work with everybody. I'm going to work with the hardcore because And they're not even right. I argue with them all the time. And I think some of them are sexist. But the people who did time, I'll work with them. I'll work with the youth who tell me things like my girlfriend's head was cracked open by the NYPD at a peaceful protest. And so now we're going to be able to pay down our bills because the state compensates with our taxpayer dollars as money. They just, you know, Breonna Taylor's family got 27 million. Like I said, that money could have gone to pre-K if you just hadn't shot her and let us control the money. Don't give it to the military, don't give it to the cops. But the state is never gonna to agree to that because we didn't even name them, right? 
You have the Koch brothers, one of them transitioned. You have the Mercers. You have Alderson. The billionaires are bankrolling this. This isn't just organic, came out of like, no. The billionaires are bankrolling this because it's a great distraction from predatory capitalism. Like, oh, we're going to talk about Toni Morrison. It's like, I don't care. Like, I want to know why we can't have a 15, you know, I campaigned for Bernie. You know, I wasn't into the black woman. I already did the Obama thing. I didn't need to keep redoing it. We have to control the violence and we have to control the money. And I don't think we have a clear plan to control either one of them. Okay, I'm looking for other hands. Uh, does anyone else uh, wish to speak? If so, just wave at me. <laughs> okay, Jurgen, he wants to follow up, I, I guess. I think you muted. I'm curious what role liberation theology has today um, in the quest for the realization of agape um, in the times in which we live, which is a, a time of extreme oppression uh, against certain people. And by the way, it's not just against certain people. We're all oppressed by the system. That's the bottom line. Um, no, it's not. Well, uh, I know it I, is, but it's not at the same time. Do you I know. Yeah, we could, we could debate that one. But anyway, um, what, what role does liberation theology play today in your mind uh, in the quest for agape? Yeah, so that brings me back to James Cone, right? Um, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I just want to be honest. Like, I just, you know, I have memories, like they're flashbacks, even though I was never in the war. But, you know, how you can murder a priest and kill the women. And let me just, you're right, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who transition violently and prematurely. And the church didn't necessarily protect them either, I would argue. Right, so that's why you have the sanctuary movement. It's always the people who go rogue, who take a God. Maybe I do can't answer this. It's the people who love more than they follow doctrine, and because they love, they're organic thinkers. They improvise. They start creating stuff that never should be there. Right? They're architects. You know, I was. Uh, you know, my partner, who's like a former Panther, right? Who's now a professor. So people live long enough to like do something else. He was telling me that St. Mark's church in the village, we were talking about it for some reason. Um, and we'll, I'll just say alleged in case like people are gonna open up old cold cases, offered sanctuary to his brother before he was captured and put in prison for eight years. The church, the church at its best, has always given sanctuary and always provided a certain kind of leadership. But that's not the only kind of church out there. We know that's the mega churches. We know that the churches that um, like said, yay, stormed the Capitol, we, you know, the white supremacy, the patriarchs, you know, the like, I need another private jet or whatever kind of church that, you know, sexual abuse, abuse of children within those structures. But this is what I was trying to say earlier, Jürgen, the state is really smart and it understands that if it designates primary targets, the people who wanna live long and comfort and just love, they will stay away from the primary targets or they will treat them as charity wards. Now the primary targets are the leaders and there are primary targets. Like, I don't know why, I think I know how you wage war, but you don't just bomb everything at the same time. You start with the primary targets and you, you make them zones of dishonor, disposability, stupidity, venality, right? So the whole, like, I'm not gonna get into the critical race thing. Cause I'm like, you know, it's like you feed the people. I'm doing different stuff, right? But you have to prove that all this literature including mouse, right? Which, you know, 
unfortunately, Whoopi Goldberg used the wrong language, you know, I kind of knew what she was trying to say, which is, you know, the graphic novel and the Holocaust. You have to prove that these writers and intellectuals are wasting your time and corrupting your kids. That guy, what was that guy's name who was there? The one who did the Sandy Hook, like, lied about the children dying. What is his name, the right-wing guy? Do you remember his name? Anybody? He's like, he's going to be, he's been subpoenaed. Alex Jones, right? So my college, my chair, like, not my chair, my a dean a couple of years ago, it's like, oh, we just scrutinized media. I want you to know that Alex Jones and David are talking about you corrupting the morals of the children. I'm like, well, and then it's like, have a nice day because you're in good company with no child. It's like, no, I got kids and I'm black. It's not the same thing, right? As these, you know, elder white leftist guys, you know, that they live long for a reason. Like we don't for a reason, right? So it's a weird seesaw balance about, I wanna be in alliance with everybody, but not everybody faces the same level of risk. I don't face the same level of risk of the people in prison, right? I don't face the same level of risk of impoverished people. So they don't have to trust me. I just have to demonstrate that I can be useful somewhere, somehow. But Alex Jones, he will demonize the parents who lost their children by saying it's a hoax. But he's not suggesting somebody roll up on them like Dylan Roof in a you know African Methodist church and pray with people and then just shoot everybody in Bible study. It isn't, I mean, there are these shootings against white people, but it's not because they're white. Nobody's ethnically cleansing them unless they're trying to tip a certain kind of balance towards terror. And yes, we all share that. But this is what I'm clear about. If we cannot differentiate primary from secondary to tertiary targets, we're out of the play because the state can and the reactionaries can, and they have a plan. First, you have to like demonize people and then you can isolate them. Then you make it normal to be that violent against them. And people are like, oh, it's never going to happen to me. Like that white woman, I don't even know her name. She's like, I'm blonde, blue eyed. I'm not going to jail. I'm going to Mexico after the, you know, they did the thing on January 6th. And the judge let her out so that she could have her two week vacation in Mexico. That never happens for black people because it's structured never to happen because we never deserve that. This is our inside joke was, if Black people had stormed the Capitol, you would be going to a lot of funerals for Black people. You don't get to hit a cop or a guard and walk away without a bullet or a beat down. So get used to brutalizing us, the thousands of Indigenous women and girls who just disappeared. Nobody, they weren't disappeared. Somebody like, you know, raped them, murdered them and buried them somewhere. Right. And because you have all these oil rigs and stuff like all these nomadic guys are showing up in these territories to drill and, and nobody can control the terror because after the drill, they move to another state. Nobody's looking for them. Right. Or even that that black serial killer. I can't remember his name. I'm all worked up. He killed 93 women. How do you how do you do that and die from old age in prison? Disproportionately, they were black. They were drug addiction addicted. They had low IQ if they were white. They were all disposable. It's like so Nazi-like. And the Nazis studied the US before they did their thing. So you dehumanize a segment, you keep expanding it, like babies on the border, you know, can't find, you know, what Trump lost, 5,500 brown and black babies. Nobody's looking for them, seriously, right? Because I would say everybody gets fired unless you find those kids and give them back to their parents. Nobody's doing that to my knowledge. You start with a sector, you radiate it out, and then you just like killing black people, I mean, is the precursor or indigenous to killing white people. And you don't really wanna kill everybody. You wanna terrorize them. So when you say the election was rigged and I'm gonna be president for life or whatever the plan is, I don't know, they don't tell me. People just like, okay. That's the way I read it. I mean, it's not a happy read, but it's not like we haven't seen this before in history. Well, I'm afraid we've um, run out of time. Uh, so we're gonna have to 
draw this to a close. I want to thank Joy James for, for sharing this uh, time with us and her thoughts. Um, she will also be speaking to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship here in San Miguel uh, on the 20th of, uh, of February. So you'll have another chance to hear further about her views, particularly on agape. Um, so I want to thank um, Joy for being with us today and um, look forward to seeing you again in a um, couple of weeks. I want to thank all of those who were here raising questions and comments as well. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. You know, today's program as well as past programs are available on YouTube accessible from our website, www.globaljusticecenter.org. And for those of you, by the way, uh, who were on our talk with uh, Michael Hudson last week that was interrupted, um, the complete uh, program of his talk is also available on our website. Uh, well, now I want to... Uh, um, invite you all to our next Black History Month speaker next Monday. She will be Sherry Steinwender, uh, who will be talking on healing racism. That's at, at one o'clock Central Time next Monday, the 14th of February. And finally, thanks to our webinar team. Roberto Robles, Liz Mestres, Gregory Diamond, uh, Olivia Canales, Betsy Bowman, and myself. And now this is Cliff Durand signing off until next Monday. Thank you.